Dogen had a nice definition for meditation, which is dethinking your thinking. You're trying to take apart the concepts that you carry around with you, especially the ones that are causing you to suffer. Now, a lot of these concepts we believe in very firmly. They're what the Thai Johns call samud. They're the conventions by which we communicate with one another, make sense of our world around us, especially in the social sphere. They're the agreements we have, both within ourselves and with other people. The word red has a certain meaning. The word blue has another meaning. Like, dislike. All the concepts of language, these are things that we've learned to agree with everybody or with one another for when we're dealing with one another. And we carry a lot of those concepts inside. We have lots of beliefs about ourselves and about how we run things inside our mind. Sometimes skillful, sometimes not. Particularly if you come from an unhealthy environment, which a lot of America is now. Many of the concepts you bring inside just for dealing with your own thoughts, figuring out what's going on inside, they're actually harmful. So you want to learn how to dethink those thoughts. It's not just a matter of putting aside, it's taking them apart, questioning them. And first, to do the proper questioning, you have to get the mind in a good place. That's why we practice concentration, so that you do think, <clears throat> you dethink your thoughts not out of desperation or from neurotic dislike for them. You put the mind in a good place, and then you can gaze back on the thoughts you've been carrying around with you, the ideas you carry around. And you can ask yourself, are those really helpful right now? Even something as simple as facing forward. You close your eyes, and the body has a sense of forward and back. But why does the mind have to carry that in? We tend to think of the mind like being the eyes that face forward. What happens if you think of the mind as being just a radiance going out in all directions, and all directions are equal? And then, of course, there are concepts about the breath. I don't know how many people have said there's no way breath can go through your nerves. How does air go through your nerves? Well, breath here isn't air, it's energy, and the many layers of energy in the body. And our society doesn't encourage us to look at these layers of energy or to deal with them or have anything to think about them. And so here's one way you can rethink your thinking. Think of the sense you have, the, the body here as just breath. Everything you know about your sense of their hands, your feet, your legs, your, your torso, your head. Just tell yourself, your first perception of these things is energy. And then beyond that, it goes into the sense of being solid or warm or cold. So it's not like you're trying to push the breath through the solid parts. You're just allowing the breath to be prior. Give it priority, and let those other things fall into the background. Because after all, it is the breath that allows you to sense these things any, to begin with. And this becomes a useful way of dealing with pain. Pain, as a, we're saying this afternoon, tends to get glommed together with the earth element, your know, sense of solidity in the body. Of course, that makes the pain solid. Then you learn how to question that. You experience the breath before you experience the pain. Think about it in that way. 
we have a tendency when there's a pain to allow the breath energy, and this is subconscious, allow the energy to flow up to the pain and then stop. Well, that makes it worse. We've tightened up around the pain in our childish desire to put a boundary, a <clears throat> boundary around it, and then the energy can't go through. We feel that the pain is there first, and we're, the breath comes second. Well, reverse that. The breath is first, the pain is second. And the breath is something that's not pain. It's a physical element. Pain is something else. It's that sharpness, that heightened sense of dislike or displeasure, discomfort. But once you untangle it from the solidity of the body, you begin to realize it's a lot more fluid and insubstantial than you would have thought. John Cha has a nice analogy. He says it's like you're sitting in the one seat in the house, and all these other things come in, and they don't have a place to sit down. They're there at your pleasure. They come and they go, but you're the one in the seat. You're in charge. Thinking this way with the breath puts you more in charge of what's going on in your sensation of the body. You're here first. The breath is here first. Pain is secondary. It's not the case that the pain has moved in and laid claim to it and pushed us out, unless we allow ourselves to be pushed out. We're there first. The breath is there first. We can start taking apart your thoughts and perceptions about the body. You can do that about with other things as well. A thought comes up, and you can recognize it's a voice from someone in your family, or someone in school, or somebody in the media, or it's one of your old defilements. In other words, your identity in the past that wants to come back. That's why they personify the defilements. Because you gave them personality by assuming them as your identity. Learn to question that. When these things come in and say things, ask yourself, what, to what extent is the opposite true? And why do I have to believe those concepts anyhow? When I was in Thailand, we'd have Dharma talks every night. They had a rotating roster of monks, and out of the fourteen monks who were giving Dharma talks, maybe two could give good Dharma talks, and the rest were boring, not very insightful, not very helpful. And so I made a game of it. Even though I could hear the talk, I was going to very definitely not understand it. It was just going to be sounds, sounds, sounds. A word would come, and I wouldn't connect it with the next word. I wouldn't connect that one with the next word. And you find that the mind can quiet down a lot faster that way. Or you can try that with your own thoughts. Just think of them as gibberish. Just think of them as a foreign language. You don't have to take on their concepts, because many times when you take on their concepts, you take on their grammar, it creates a kind of reality. This, again, this is what they call samut in Thai. Conventions, supposings. It's interesting that the word for a convention also means a supposing. You suppose things into being. You make that, those agreements. And you don't have to agree with them all the time. So for the time being, I'm just going to be here with the breath, and I don't have to agree with any other thought that comes in, any other language that comes in. As soon as a thought appears, think of it dissolving away, think of it exploding. Pains arise in the body. Okay, think of them being dispersed, dispersed. You're not clamping down on them. Because all too often that's what we do. A pain comes in, and our instinctive reaction is, how can I make sure this doesn't spread? And so we tense up around it as a way of thinking that that keeps it from spreading. Of course, that actually creates extra pain. 
So instead of thinking of the pain as a thing that's there, think of it just these moments that come and go, come and go. They're whizzing past and they're going away from you. Instead of coming at you from the front, think of them coming at you from the back. Again, you've got the right to think in those directions because they're coming from the back. As soon as you realize that they're there, they're going away. That loosens up a lot of the tightness and tension, a lot of the sense of being burdened by these things, of being attacked by these things, of being on the receiving end. You don't have to receive them. They're not guests. They're, you're not obliged to be polite with them. You're sitting here with your eyes closed. You don't have to have anything to do with anything else. And see how many of your conventions and supposings and internal agreements you can put aside, at least for the time being. You can de-think them. Flip them around, turn them inside out. Just think of them as being gibberish right now. The only thing that's real is your sense of awareness. Very clearly here, with the sensation of the breath, sensation of energy here for the body. Eventually you want to de-think that, but not yet. Use that to de-think other things. That way the things that have long had a hold on the mind don't have a hold on it anymore because you're not holding on to them. The Buddha's image is of fire. Fire feeds on its fuel, it clings to the fuel, and as a result is stuck on its fuel. It's interesting that a lot of ancient cultures had that image of fire as clinging. The I Ching talks about fire as clinging as well. And of course it clings. You take a stick with a flaming end and you try to shake the fire off the stick and it holds on to the stick no matter how much you swing it around. It clings and as a result it's trapped. That's the language they use. It gets freed when it goes out. It's freed because it lets go. And how are you going to be free of your thoughts unless you learn how to let them go? If you keep digging them up and hanging on to them, digging up, hanging them on to them, they present themselves and you immediately turn things into the cup of reality that fits into your conventional, supposed, agreed-on reality. And that places lots of limitations on you. Learn how to question those agreements and say, I'll. I'll Use those agreements when they're necessary, or use those supposings, those suppositions when they're necessary. But right now they're not. Why carry them around? They'll come back when you need them. But a lot of those things you don't need right now. All you have to do is just be aware of the breath. It's all around you. It's bathing you. It's not the case that you're on one side of the breath, facing forward, looking at the breath. It's all around you. So try to have an all-around awareness of this all-around element and see how that changes the dynamic inside. 